So Mary was the first person sent to tell the apostles, which means Mary was the first apostle. Yes? The first apostle. And so we could call her the apostle to the apostles. I wish my children were here so I could say, that's why you always listen to your mother, because the first apostle was a woman. All right? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, so that the King of glory might come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord high and mighty, exalted in battle, and he shall reign forever. Good morning, Alf. Good afternoon, Alfred Street. I bring you greetings on this Resurrection Sunday. I am happy to be with you, standing in for our pastor on Easter Sunday, no pressure. <laughs> and for those of you who are feeling just a little tight in the face because you came to hear pastor, there are tapes that you can purchase. <laughs> right? So now that we've got that settled, if you open your ears, there is a word from the Lord. If you are able, I'm going to ask you to stand as we turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 20. And I hope you have on your comfortable shoes. We're going to be reading the first 16 verses. John 20 verses 1 through 16. I'm reading in the New Revised Standard Version today. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been laid on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. But Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. She turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. This afternoon, I want to teach and preach on the topic in the garden. In the garden. You may be seated. I grew up in a small church, and my mother had a beautiful, beautiful soprano voice. And because it was a small church, that meant that she was often called upon to sing solos. Pastor Wesley knows what that, that's like. You know, have to sing quite a bit. And her signature song, y'all just got that. Her signature song was in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God, discloses. He speaks, 
and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody he gave to me still in my heart is ringing. I'd stay in the garden all day, though the night around me is falling. But he bids me go through this voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. When we hear the lyrics of that song, it's easy to see a connection to the passage that we just read. Because the song describes this intimate moment between a person and the Lord together in the garden. You can see the connection between the scripture reading and the song. But when you look at this John reading closely, that song is not accurately depicting what happened in John. If you look at John closely, there's a whole lot of drama in those 16 verses, right? Starts off and it's dark. And there's all this crying and mistaken identity and running and movement. There's so much going on, you could use a playbook. There's a cave. Here's Mary. The stones rolled away. She runs over here to get Peter and John. Peter and John run back over here. John gets there first, but he doesn't go in. Peter comes behind and goes in, and then John goes in behind him. There's nothing in there except the clothes. They come out and go home. Now Mary comes up, bringing up the rear, and she looks in, and now two people, two angels inside the tomb. They say to her, Mary, why are you weeping? She says, they've taken my Lord away. She never stops to acknowledge that there are two angels in the tomb. <laughs> Then she comes out, turns around, and there's Jesus, except she doesn't know it's Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping? What are you looking for? That is John's story about the resurrection. The Gospel of John is written in a particular way. John wants to shape our understanding of the resurrection so that we understand his theology. And John has never doubted the divinity of Jesus. John knows from the very beginning, in the beginning was the word, from the very beginning, John knows that Jesus is divine. And if you understand the divinity of Jesus, the resurrection was never a problem. If you understand who Jesus is, it stands to reason that there would be a resurrection. So as far as John's concerned, as soon as we get to the crucifixion, we've reached the climax of the story. The only reason John's talking about the resurrection is because John is interested in how the disciples respond to the resurrection. John wants to know, how do we receive the news? How do we understand what has happened? And who will we become? in light of a resurrected Christ. And so in chapter 20, we have the stories, three stories of three characters, Mary, the disciples, and Thomas. But we start with Mary. And so this morning, I want to invite you to walk with me through Mary's day, to walk in the sandals of Mary as she comes to terms with a resurrected Christ. Amen? Y'all with me? Amen. All right. So we want to look at Mary Magdalene. And one of the first things we want to recognize is that this gospel tells us that Mary was the first person to witness the risen Christ. She was the first. And in this passage, Jesus will send her to tell the other disciples. And the word apostle means one sent. So Mary was the first person sent to tell the apostles, which means Mary was the first apostle. Yes? The first apostle. And so we could call her the apostle to the apostles. I wish my children were here so I could say, that's why you always listen to your mother, because the first apostle was a woman, all right? And unfortunately, Mary Magdalene did not have a good public relations rep. 
because in the sixth century, Pope Gregory the Great decided that he was going to start a rumor about Mary. And the funny thing about rumors is sometimes the rumors we send out say more about who we are than who the person is. Now, I don't know Pope Gregory, so I'm not trying to cast any shade. But it is interesting that he decided that because Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary, that somehow that had something to do with her sexuality. There's nothing in the Bible about that. But because he started that, to this day, people associate Mary Magdalene with a woman of an improper reputation. And when you watch Jesus Christ Superstar tonight with John Legend on television, <laughs> you will see that that image of Mary persists until this day. And isn't it funny how negative information about somebody whether it's true or false, just seems to have staying power. What we do know from the scripture about Mary Magdalene is that Jesus did in fact cast out seven demons. And the other thing we know from all four gospels is that Mary witnessed the resurrection. All four Gospels. Now hear me, because when we do those seven last words on Friday, on Good Friday, we have to pull from all the Gospels. No one Gospel has all of it. No one Gospel has everything. But all four Gospels say Mary Magdalene was a witness to the resurrection. Mary Magdalene was there. And I imagine that Mary Magdalene was there when the nails went into his wrists, and into his feet. She was there when that cross made that sickening thud sound, when it went into the ground. And she heard all seven of the last seconds. She heard all seven of them. She could smell that air that was thick with sweat and blood. And she may have even seen him breathe his last. Mary Magdalene was a witness who had an image in her mind of Christ on the cross because she was there. And when you understand what she experienced and what she witnessed, you can understand why she was crying, why her grief was so great, and why she was acting the way she was in this reading. The passage of scripture says Mary was making her way to the tomb before it was light. Why was a woman walking by herself in the dark to the tomb? Where, what was she doing? She wasn't going to prepare the body because in the Gospel of John, the body of Christ had already been prepared by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Where is Mary going? in the middle of the night? What possesses her to risk her own safety to get to the tomb? I wonder about how sometimes we experience something so painful, a trauma or a loss or a grief, and we keep going back to that place. We go back to the, the scene of the crime. You know how on the roadside sometimes you see a memorial where an accident was with stuffed animals and crosses. And when we have tragedies, people bring flowers and things at the place. We feel like we need to be connected to the place where this terrible, terrible thing happens. And I think Mary is so grief-stricken that she's not thinking about anything else except trying to make a connection to the last place where she knew her Lord was. Mary is tethered to the tomb. She's trying to get to Jesus' body. And some of us find ourselves hanging out in the place of our greatest pain. Just hovering around, staying right there, because that's where everything ended for me. That's where it all stopped. And so we have here in this story of Mary an opportunity to ask this question. 
How are we supposed to experience the power of the resurrection when we have so much to grieve? How are we supposed to sing Alleluia? How are we supposed to sing Praise God? How are we supposed to show our praise and our joy and our thanksgiving when in fact there is so much to grieve in our lives? I wonder this morning what Easter is like for the families of the victims of the Parkland shooting. Sitting in church, listening to words about death not having a sting. What is it like for the victims of Sandy Hook who get re-injured every single time there's another shooting? What is it like for the family of Stefan Clark? Six bullets in the back, one on the side, one in the leg, no weapon. Some of us are here on Easter Sunday feeling like the grave is having a little bit of a victory. Where is our resurrection when they're still drinking bottled water in Flint and places you never heard of because it didn't make the news? Or maybe you just buried a loved one this week or you're still unemployed. You know a little bit about what Mary Magdalene might be doing when she's standing at that tomb, tending to death, tethered to pain and grief and loss. See, this morning, some of us need to hear this story because, yes, the stone is rolled away, and yes, the grave clothes are on the floor, and yes, the tomb is empty, and the Lord is, in fact, risen but we are still on life support. Some of us are spiritual zombies, dressed up, smiling, and a little bit dead inside. Now the writer of John, as I told you, is not concerned with proving to you that the resurrection happened. He's not interested in the historicity of those events, but he wants to know how it is real for us. And so here we have Mary coming to the burial place, and she can't find what she's looking for at the tomb. She gets there, but what she's looking for is not there. She's going for a corpse, but what she gets is an encounter. Hear me, she's looking for a body, but what she finds is Jesus. She's looking for a place to hold on to her grief, but instead what she gets is an opportunity to know new life. And isn't that just like God? How many of you, y'all can raise your hands, it's all right. How many of you, have had the experience of encountering God when that's the last thing you were looking for, right? You know what this is like. This happens to me every, not every time, but almost every time. I'm about to open my mouth and say something I shouldn't say, and then somebody comes around the corner who really admires me. Right? Just when you least expect it, you are planting your feet and headed towards a door you should not go through and you get a call from your grandmama, hi baby, right? The Lord just placed you on my heart this morning. You're like, dang it, grandma, right? How often do we encounter God when we least expect it? It happened to Jacob. Jacob was just running for his life, sleeping on a rock. And he wakes up to say, God was in this place, and I did not know it. Moses is out tending his father-in-law's sheep, and all of a sudden he hears a voice that says, take off your shoes, home. You are on holy ground. Saul is going to persecute Christians because he's so saved, he knows what's best for everybody. And a great light comes from heaven 
and changes him forever. So here's Mary looking for a body. She's about to encounter the living God. So one of the things we learn from this story is even when you are not sure of what you are looking for, know that God is looking for you. Here we go on our fast track to nowhere. Here we are bound up in our filthy rags of righteousness. Here we are running around death and the Lord shows up and surprises us with life. What we learn about the resurrection is that this resurrection means that God will invite us to know Jesus in new ways. Now I want you to think about this because because it's Easter Sunday, hallelujah, he's risen, we have been on this timeline, right, that started back in February. In February we had Ash Wednesday, remember? We got the ashes. That was the beginning of Lent, and some of y'all are so happy to be coming out of Lent today. And so we had this period of Lent, and this last week was Holy Week, right? We had something every day commemorating Jesus' last week on earth right after we had our Palm Sunday. Then we came right into Holy Week. We had um, Monday, Thursday service, and then we had the seven last words, and then we had Holy Saturday or Silent Saturday, and here we are, heroes! Here we are. And there's something good about understanding that timeline. It's a sequence that gets repeated over and over and over again. It gets re repeated in the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day, he rose again. We get it in the song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Right? They hung him. They laid him in the tomb. He rose up. There's a sequence. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. It is really important to acknowledge that it was a historical event that the resurrection takes place in a time. But the whole point of the resurrection happening is so that it doesn't get limited to any single moment in time. The resurrection means God's presence is accessible to us in any time. And what Mary learns is that it means God is present to us in any place. All right, so stay with me here. So Mary... And her encounter with the Lord takes place in a specific location. She goes to the place of the tomb. She's in this place of death. And where she is, at the tomb, at the place of death, is where the Lord comes for her. Yeah. Right? Think about this. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were dead and placed in a tomb and came out, I'm not trying to go back to that place, right? Jesus has no reason to go back to the tomb. Jesus is resurrected. He's done with that. Served his time, did what he had to do. The world's redeemed. Let's get going to the ascension. The only reason for Jesus to go back to the tomb is to get Mary. And if you understand that, that means that if Jesus is going to go back to the tomb for Mary, Jesus is going to come to whatever place of death you happen to be hanging out in for you. For you. You can be lost. You can be dazed. You can be confused. You can be guilty and dead wrong. Jesus is coming to that place. Our resurrected Lord has to bring the life to wherever you are. The psalmist understood this when the psalmist said, there is nowhere we can go where God is not. Jesus returns to the place of death for us. Don't ever take for granted the price that was paid and what lengths God will go to for you. The other thing we want to learn about Mary is that Jesus keeps at it. 
until he reaches us. You remember how this goes. She gets there, she doesn't know what to do. She runs back over here, right? And then she comes back and she sees the angels, but somehow it never occurs to her that those are angels. Think about how focused you have to be or how grief-stricken you have to be, right? Because angels don't look like us. Angels, I think, must look really special and really awesome. But she was so connected to her grief that she couldn't recognize it. What do we miss every day? Because we're so focused on holding on to our pain or so consumed by our grief that we miss the angels every day. Now this, this part of the story really bothers me and um, I was sharing earlier, if you were to meet my sisters and I would allow you to speak with them for an extended period of time, what they would tell you growing up was that I was always book smart but never had common sense. Never had common sense. Couldn't get myself out of a shoebox if I had, you know, I just couldn't quite figure things out. So when I read this story, it bothers me because I, I think I could be Mary. I think, I could like see angels and not know it because I'm so busy trying to get this thing done that I'm missing it. And that frightens me because I don't want to miss what God has for me. But what we learn in this story is if you miss it, God's going to come back again and again and again until you get it. Even Mary, even me. The, one of the movies that um, I really loved um, back in the day was called um, The Last of the Mohicans. It had Daniel Day-Lewis in it, Madeline Stowe. And there was a whole lot going on in this movie, and some of it the people brought on themselves, but that's another story. The point I want to make is that there's a point where Madeline Stowe and um, Daniel Day-Lewis are getting separated, and he yells to her, just stay alive and I'll find you. And that's this line I use with my kids when we go to an amusement park or we're going somewhere and we separate and go, just stay alive, I'll find you. And yes, it's a little dramatic, but I mean what I'm saying. I'm your mother. It's my job to find you if we get separated. And if we being evil know how to give good things, how much more does our Heavenly Father care about us? God says, it's okay if you don't get it today, I will find you. If you don't get it when the angels come, I'm going to send the gardener. And if you don't recognize who the gardener is, I'm going to have him call you by name because my sheep know my voice. Jesus is going to keep at it until he reaches us. And finally, on this Sunday morning, we need to acknowledge the fact that in light of the resurrection, death is not going away. It's not going away, but neither is Jesus. Okay? Death is always going to be with us until the end of time. But Jesus is with us in that death. Stay with me now. Think about the location, all right? Mary is running to the tomb because that's the place of death. She's going to the place where they lay dead bodies, where bodies decay. She's going there. Jesus meets her there, but the tomb is in a garden. The tomb, let's try it again, is in a garden. A garden. A garden is a place where things grow. A garden is a place where life happens. In fact, if you were to go all the way back to Genesis, I think it all started in a garden. So here you have the finality of death surrounded by God's creative power. There is nothing that can die that Christ, can, that God cannot bring back. There is no pain you have that is too great for God to carry with you. There is no thing in you, no death, no suffering, no agony that Jesus cannot shoulder with you. 
Now, we need to hear this because the fact of the matter is, on this Easter Sunday, there are some folks who are thinking about folks who were here last Easter who are not here this Easter. And some of us have had loved ones gone so long that we can count the number of Easter's we've been without somebody, right? So I know that in my own life, um, my mother died when I was 15 years old, which means I've been alive longer without her than I have been with her. And I'm blessed. I need you to hear that. God has been good to me. I have an amazing, amazing family. I have work that I love. I have work that I love. And uh, <laughs> I'm part of an amazing church where I feel blessed. And sometimes, well, all the time, I'm carried around a little death in me. Because for all of the blessings I have, I still miss my mom. Yeah. And I wish she could be here right now. And I know I'm not alone when I say that. I'm saying that we all have a little death that we carry around inside of us. And I don't want you to sit here and think that the resurrection means that that goes away. We carry a little death around with us. But the power of the resurrection means that you also carry Jesus with you in that place of death and in that place of loss and in that place of suffering. Jesus is there. So some of us have this grief that we've been living with and we can manage it. But others of us today have grief that is fresh. Some of us are here barely holding it together, overwhelmed by grief. And if we were honest, we're a little bit like Mary. We ran over to the tomb, and we couldn't get what we needed there. So we went back over this way to where Peter and John were, and we tried to get some help from our sisters and brothers, and then we followed them back, and we still cannot find what we need. But when you turn around, yeah. right there, Jesus is standing calling you by name, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. This morning, we stand as witness to the resurrection. And even for the grief we carry, we do not grieve as those who have no hope because we know a Jesus who will walk with you and talk with you and tell you that you are his own right there at that tomb and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. Amen. Thank you.